preaching about the Bible, we'll read the chapter, longest chapter in the Bible. It just happens to be about the Bible. 176 verses, and almost every one of them, probably 172 of them, mention the Bible, the Word of God, precepts, commandments, or something like that. Psalm 119, and look at verse number 42. I've been announcing the title of the message tonight, How You Know You Can Trust the Bible. It'll be online as, You Can Trust the Bible. You Can Trust the Bible. Psalm 119, and look at verse number 42. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me. See that? For I trust in thy word. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I want to preach on the subject, you can trust the Bible. Now, as you know, we are living. We are living tonight, as, you, as, as everybody, everybody here knows, in the most, by far, untrusting, untrustworthy generation in history. Nobody knows what to believe, who to believe, what to think, what not to think, what's true, what's not true. Uh, it, it almost seems like nobody trusts anybody anymore. It's a weird spirit that's come over our generation, and, and probably for good reason. You know, there was a time in this country growing up uh, 75 years ago, when you're in, in the 30s, the 40s, and even in the 50s, you could just about trust anybody in authority. Uh, you, you, in those days, you could trust your teachers. When you went to school and your teachers taught on something, people trusted it. They just believed the teacher knows what he's talking about. They believed it. It's not that way now. Back in those days, you could trust uh, his, his history uh, classes and history books. You read something in the history books, you just said, well, that's right. That's the way it happened. Not that way now. Uh, you, and, and science, science. Years ago, we studied science. We just thought, well, that's the way it is. Not that way now. There's a lot of science falsely so-called. You could trust your financial advisors. People at the bank would help you to know what to do with your money or how to spend it. Or what to invest. There was a time when most people trusted. You know, there was a time in this country when a man could go down to the bank and say, I need to borrow you know, a $500. That was a big loan back then. And say, I'm a member of the Methodist Church. And they'd loan him the money just on his, na- on his word. That's how trustworthy people used to do. Try that now. Uh, Lord, you have to put your soul up for collateral almost uh, to get anything nowadays. But because of a lack of trust, your teachers, uh, your doctor. You remember back in the, uh, the old days, you could trust the doctor. That's what my doctor said. And you could take it to the bank. Now, you don't know even to trust the doctors. The doctors allow political views to influence even the medicine they descri- uh, prescribe for you. And you can get certain medicines because you're a certain political view, and you can't buy ivermectin, uh, or even they won't prescribe it, because of their political views and things like that. That's crazy. You can't even trust the doctor. You know, you can't even trust the doctor. They might want you to say, ah, you're old enough. I don't care. Go ahead and die. Uh, you don't know if you can even trust them at all. There was a time when you could trust the police. Uh, the policeman, you just figured the policeman said it. That was right. And, and by and large, it's still that way. Uh, but there, you can't trust them all now. Preachers. There was a time when a man said, I'm a preacher, buddy. If he said something, that was it. I mean, people took it to the bank. Nowadays, preachers are way down on the list as, as far as trust. And the media. What about the media? Can you trust what you see on the news? For heaven's sake, no. I'm telling you, we're living in a time when people say, what in the world do I trust? Now, it's even under attack of the Bible itself. Years ago, it was called the good book. They had, uh, mamas had raised, people didn't even go to church. The good book says, you do this, and you do that, and you do the other. There was a time when the Bible was quoted in the courtroom. And say, the scripture says, therefore we judge it. There was a time when the Bible was quoted in the classroom. Uh, well, the Bible says, and even use it in the Bible. But they, 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 went, they went haywire, brother. Something went very, very, very wrong. Now, I'm going to preach tonight on how you can trust the Bible. Can we really trust it? People, this is our life we're messing around with here. We better know what's right 
We better know what we believe and why we believe it. We better know because we're going to die one of these days. And when it comes time to die, I want to know that I can trust a book that I've lived by all these years. I believe This is not a game to me. Uh, church is not a game. I could find something else to do in my life if I wanted to. A lot of things. Uh, but I, I'm doing this because I believe that this book, is God's Word preserved for us in these last days and that God has not left us down here in this old world without a word from Him that me and you can believe in. Glory to God. And so tonight, I want to preach on uh, how we know you can trust the Bible. Number one, I want to say you can trust a book. You can trust a book that has divine origin. The origin of the Bible is both human and divine. As a matter of fact, the Bible, uh, uh, people say, oh, man wrote the Bible. That's only partly true. God wrote the Bible using men's hand. Here, here's the way the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'll never forget Dr. Ed Maccabee, one of my strongest mentors, and I'll never forget him standing up and looking at that congregation. He said the definition of inspiration is that the Holy Ghost of God got a hold of the head and the heart and the hand of those men and inspired His Word. And they were spake as they moved by the Holy Ghost. It has a divine origin. Did you know the Bible was written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500, yes, you heard me right, 1,500 years. Most of the men that wrote the Bible never even knew each other or met each other in real life. And yet, it all comes together without a contradiction, without a mistake, without a, a hitch in the whole thing. No other book in the world is like that or can even come close. It's not outmoded. It's outstanding. It's not obsolete. It's absolute. It's not discredited. It's disregarded. It's it's not uh, uh, it it's not out out, out out it outshines. It outcasts. It outranks. It outlives. It outweighs. It outwears. It outsells every other book on planet Earth. It is the most revered, it is the most feared, it is the most loved, it is the most hated book on the planet because it has a divine origin. Did you know that the phrase, thus saith the Lord, or God said, God said, is almost 2,000 times in your Bible. Almost 2,000 times. Them men didn't just make this up. It was, thus saith the Lord. Do this. Thus saith the Lord. Don't do that. Now, it is the final authority, and we, because of that, it is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. We've been studying uh, philosophy on, on Wednesday night. Some Colossians 2.8 is that bombshell verse that blows all modern-day philosophy to hell where it belongs. And uh, those, those verses teach us that philosophy and the force behind modern-day philosophy, listen to me, students, college and high school, the force behind all higher learning and philosophy is to overthrow, undermine, and replace the Bible. Uh, just like the devil told Eve there in the garden, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He appealed to her intellect. He said, you'll be smarter if you'll listen to me and undercut the word of God. So all philosophy out there in the world, uh, you go to psychology class in high, uh, college, uh, you take higher learning in college classes, the whole point of every bit of that is to convince you that the human brain is the highest authority in any generation and that the Bible was just a book put together by men that did the best they could. Uh, he said you should be his God. And so-called science, uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Voltaire, Karl Marx, Bertrand Russell, uh, all of them people believed that the brain 
was the highest authority. We believe the Bible and I can trust the Bible tonight because of its origin. There is no other book in history that was put together over 1,500 years and fits together and withstands the test of time and, brother, uh, uh, never find something wrong with it. You can count on it. If there's something wrong with the Bible, they'd have found it by now because there have been people searched that thing for literally thousands of years. Number two, I will say, secondly tonight, you can trust the Bible because the Bible admits, listen, the flaws and errors of its authors. No other book an author's writing and tells about his bad stuff in his life. There's no other book like that. All the way through it, David in the Psalms. A man don't write an autobiography uh, and a man don't write his life story and tell his worst sins and mistakes and make yourself look like that. All the way through there, those Jews, every author in the Bible was a Jew. And God gave the oracles of God to them. Some people fuss about Luke, but they don't know what they're talking about. Every author in the Bible was a Jew. And David wrote, My wounds stink because of my foolishness against thee. And the only have I sinned. My sin is ever before me. Read about that. Oh, Jonah. There's not a, a print that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. But he's the only one I can think of that would know the story. So he right or told it somebody. And they wrote it. And Jonah wrote down, Jonah run from the presence of the Lord. Who, who, who writes a book and points out their own flaws like that? Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis. And Moses wrote the book of Genesis, a great man, by the meekest man on the earth. And he puts in there about him losing his temper, him smiting the rock. He don't even get to go in the promised land. If you wrote a book, would you write it that? Would you write that? If you wrote a book, would you write it like, well, I'm the hero leader and I'm the hero and everything, but I messed around and lost my temper and God wouldn't even let me go. No, no. You'd put it in there. I got to go. I got to get in. We saw this and we saw that. I, I know. I know how I know I can trust the Bible. Ain't no other book in the world that does that. Abraham was the same way. The apostle Paul, the great man in the New Testament. You know what Paul said about himself? He said, I'm the chief of sinners. I mean, he was learned. He was educated. He could speak, I don't know how many different languages. Educated by right to the T and in the laws of the, the Pharisees and the Jewish people. And Paul said, woe is me. What I try to do right, I can't. What I want to do wrong, I, I, what I, I don't want to do wrong, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He points out his own flaws. And then even in the New Testament, the Jew, you know the who the Bible said crucified Jesus? The Jews did. His own people. And the Jew, the Bible tells the truth about the Jews. And brother, they had Jesus crucified. And the Romans did it. But the Jews had it done. And the Bible said for envy they delivered him. You wouldn't write a book like that and say we are so jealous of the Son of God we had him killed. Nobody is going to write a book. Solomon uh, in, in his proverb wrote about his foolishness and the strange women that he got mixed up with. Isaiah who wrote about all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and all of that. Lord, over and over and over in 2 Kings 9 and verse 33. Stuff like this right here. So like this right here. In 2 Kings 9 and verse 33, the Bible said that uh, they, King Tom said, uh, you go throw old Jezebel down there and the dogs are going to lick her blood. That was the prophecy that God's man had made. And you know, sure enough, old Jezebel was up there one day and they went up there and they said, fling her down, brother. And did you know what? The Bible said that when, when she came off of that wall, some of her blood sprinkled on the wall and some of it on the horses. Stuff like that right there. When I read stuff like that right there, I'd say, Why would, you, who, would you stick that in there? Would you just stick that in there? Some of her blood sprinkled on horses? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. That ain't made up. Detail. You know, you go in a courtroom, when people provide details in a case like that, that's a strong argument for what they're saying. It just happened to say that some of her blood Spring. Did you know that when the, the Lord, the night the Lord was betrayed, that Peter stood over there and the Bible said 
that, that Peter uh, stood and warmed himself. Of all of that going on, all of that, the Son of God being betrayed and being taken captive, and it just sticks it in there. He's, why does it say he's warming himself? What's that got to do with anything? You know, that spiritually, he warmed himself by the enemy's fire. Nobody would have put that in there. Uh, uh, when, when it starts taking, when you got to get warm the way they get warm, you're backslid. When, it, when you got to get thrills like they get theirs, you ain't right with God. That, stuff like that. I read the Bible all the time. And stuff like that, I just think there's no way. There's no way. There is no way in the world. I read over there when Jesus was crucified. And it said, the napkin that was about his head was over here in a place by itself. What, what, what's the point in that? What is the point? And it's over and over and over and over. There is a point in it, but people don't realize that. I remember in reading Matthew chapter 2. And those kings came to see the Lord Jesus Christ when he was a baby. And he looks over there, then they look at him. And for the, for the weirdest reason, the Bible said they departed into their country another way. What does it matter which way they went back home? What does it matter? Why would the Holy Ghost, why would a man write a Bible, but just make it up, and say they went and saw that baby over there that they believed that was a Christ, and they departed back home? It just said they went back home. Now, you know why it says that. Everybody who meets Jesus goes back another way. Nobody comes to Jesus Christ and goes away the same way that they came. You can't even count. I mean, it's over and over and over and over. Do you notice stuff like that? I see it all the time, all the time. I wish I could tell you all the time. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, when they come over there and they come to that donkey and it's getting down time to him be crucified. And they came over there and he said, you're going to find that donkey tied and you untie him and bring him there. And the Bible said they went over there in a place where two ways met. Why did he say that? What would be the point in saying it was in a place where two of When them disciples got there, they had to make up their mind. Was they going to take that donkey back and stay with him? Or was they going to cut out and go the other way? It's over and over and over. I'm telling you, there is no other book in the world. Not to mention all the tops of the Old Testament. The rock that was in the Old Testament. And the Bible said, the Lord said, smite the rock. Bam. And water came out and watered the people. A picture of Jesus Christ being hit on the cross and the water of life come out. The serpent on the pole over there where the Bible said that Moses put that serpent on a pole and they lifted it up. And anybody that had a snake bite could look at that. I mean, can you not see that? That was a thousand years before it ever happened, people. And they looked and they got well. What a picture of the serpent on the pole. A picture of Jesus Christ becoming sin. Listen, if I'd have wrote that, if you'd have wrote that, we'd have said a dove was on a pole. We'd have said, uh, uh, we'd have said a lamb, right? We'd have put the, we wouldn't have made a serpent. But the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen, brother. Listen, I ain't been doing this 50 years just because I ain't got nothing else to do. I've got a strong, deep, deep conviction that what this book says is true. It's right. Bless God, it'll stand when the world's on fire. And I'm glad to say tonight, you can trust the book, brother, that tells the fits of its all and flaws of its author. Number three. Number three. I'm just getting out of the gate now. We're going to take off. Right, number three. We're talking here tonight about you can trust the book that answers life's hard questions. This book has the answer to all life's hard questions. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? Why is there pain and suffering? I get so sick and tired of these people coming on YouTube. And uh, one lady got on the other day and she said, you can't tell me there's God. If there's a God, why does he let so much suffering go on in the world? You know, there's not a scientist or a philosopher or a theologian that don't read the Bible in the world that can answer that question. If you went to the University of North Carolina next week and gave them $100,000 and throw it down the trash can, you might as well. They can't answer three main questions. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? And where are we going? That's it. They don't know. They don't even know the questions, let alone the answers. And the question, where did we come from? You honestly, honestly, if you think about it, there is no such thing as an honest thinking atheist. Amen. 
No such thing. If he's honest, he ain't thinking. And if he's thinking, he ain't honest. Because if you're an atheist and believe there's no God, you got to go back there far enough somewhere where there wasn't nothing. And then there was everything. And as you've heard me say over and over and over, there are only four explanations for all of us, even everything and all of us even being here to start with. If you had every scientist, every, uh, every archaeologist, every geologist in the world here tonight, they would all fall into one of these three, four categories. Number one, it came supernaturally out of nowhere by itself. In school, they call that the Big Bang. And they believe there was a little bitty dust particle and it exploded and out came the planets and the stars and that's why we're supposedly still moving 66,000 miles an hour around the sun while spinning 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, and we're going through space the entire solar system at like a million miles an hour because the Big Bang started it and it's still happening. We're going out that. Now look, buddy. Uh, look, look. I ain't the smartest person in the world, but you you got you got to be smoking some bad dope to believe uh, that there was a little bitty tiny dot and everything in the, all the universe where dot come from? Where, where how, how did it get here? You you got to get back there far enough sometime when there was nothing. And it, there wasn't even a nothing for a nothing to be there. And there wasn't a nothing for something to come out of. They can't get that deep in college. Hey, man, listen, I know you can trust this book. You say, well, what's out there in outer space? God is. He said, I feel heaven and earth. He's out there. You know, if you go far enough in outer space and far enough in outer space, far enough in outer space, I guess so. I am so. I'm so ticked. I guess that's what y'all these words kids say. I'm I'm so aggravated. Uh, all these pictures now. Have you seen these pictures they're putting on on online? And they got like a square, and it's got like a million million little tiny dots, and it said you are here, and it says one of our one of the little tiny dots is our solar system, and they say you can't tell me there's not life on another planet. Have you seen these stupid pictures of Mars? They're putting. On, how many of y'all seen that? Uh, everybody's putting on pictures of Mars, and it got wind blowing. You hear the wind blowing and there's a rock and there's a rock and there's a rock I, ain't it a, you, they, Mars is 185 million miles away 185 million miles and you are seeing pictures as clear as a bell and it's weird that none of this ever happened till AI generated photographs started happening uh, artificial intelligence and you can make anything look like anything nowadays I don't believe that a bit more than I believe that New York City's inside that piano I don't believe I don't believe that Mars a bit more uh, 185 come on man I mean uh, you know it's a spirit that make people people want to do anything keep them believing the Bible uh, because it gets them out of being accountable to God. If God ain't real, we don't have to give an account for it. So they just swallow the devil's life. I'm telling you, it answers life hard question. Number one, it came supernaturally out of nowhere by itself. Number two, number two, it always has been here. That means eternity of matter. If that were true, the sun would have burned out a long, long, long time ago. And it would have been froze to death. Number three, it ain't even here. You just think it is. And that's getting very popular in Hollywood now. We're in a simulation. They're making movies now of of it's all a simulation. We're we're all dreaming. We're all didn't none, none, you know strawberry fields. Nothing is real. You know them idiot fornicating dope addicts from Liverpool. Uh, they said that. That's right, brother. Uh, they 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 deceived a generation. I'm telling you, something is real. There's something nothing real. And then the fourth explanation is there's a God in heaven that spoke it into existence, just exactly like. Genesis 1 1 said, In the beginning, uh, what God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God made the heavens and the earth. And God made man. And God made woman. He only made two genders. He didn't make Adam and Steve. I'm, that's right. That's right, brother. I'm telling you, he made Adam and Eve. And they had youngins. And they had youngins. And they had youngins. And they had youngins. And here we are. In all of our mess. I'm telling you, that's the only book in the world that answers life's 
hard questions. You know all them birds? I can't, you ever seen all them birds in the fall and they're getting ready to fly south and there's a thousand of them up there and they're all flying like this and all these birds are going like this and then all of a sudden they all go and turn that way. How in the world? Birds ain't very smart. How do they know how to do that? What, what do they do? Radar each other. We're getting ready to take a ride right up here in about a thousand feet. Everybody be ready. Bam. I, no. God put that in. Fish do the same thing. You got a school of fish. And there's 10,000 little bitty fish. And, and what's them in there? And they all move at the same time. Uh, you mean to tell me that is an accident? Uh, do you realize atheism is a temper tantrum thrown at God? Why do you think we're seeing all this crazy stuff about our evolution is the biggest, most ridiculous fraud and lie that's ever been pawned off on the human race, brother? There is not one shred of evidence that anything evolved from anything, there are variations within the kinds. That's not evolution. No kind ever changes into another kind. God said everything I'm wrong about after its kind. I'm proud to say tonight, you can trust a book, brother, that answers our hard questions like that. Say, what about suffering? Why are little children born deformed? Why are children born with cleft palates and with deformities? Why? Preacher, why? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It ain't because we evolved from an amoeba. It's because of sin in the world. The suffering in this world is caused by sin. And God's going to let sin run its course. Let me explain something to you. When God made everything, He made it right and perfect. He looked down and He said, it is good. He looked, made them, it is good. He looked down and made it good. Now, some people are crazy. They think it's all still good. I think I picked up a guy hitchhiking one time, and he was talking about smoking body. He said, yeah, man, I just smoke a little weed every now and then, man. I just smoke a little weed. He didn't know where he I said, man, you know, that stuff ain't good for you. Uh, you don't need to do that. And he said, uh, but God made it, didn't he? Wasn't everything God made good? Uh, people like that just dumb enough. They know just enough Bible to mess them up. And I said, yeah, it was good when he made it. That was before the curse. Everything God said was good in chapter 1 and 2. The curse came in chapter 3, and from then on, everything ain't good. He said, well, if God didn't want to smoke pot, why does he let it grow? Well, God made rattlesnakes. You don't kiss one in the mouth. You're supposed, you're supposed to have enough sense to discern what's good and evil and, and, uh, and all of that. So that's the answer to suffering and sin in the world. The answer to suffering and sin is, listen, people, we're not... People say, oh, you stupid Christians. You, you know, you take this person to deform and only got one ear or no legs, and you say they're made in the image of God? No! They ain't none of us made in the image of God. You say, ain't we all created in the image of God? No! You surely don't think God looks like this. <laughs> God made, listen to me, God made Adam and Eve in his image. It was so glorious we can't even imagine how that must have looked. Then Adam sinned and lost that image. We were talking about it yesterday. And when that happened, Adam's children were in his image. They ain't never been but two people created. The rest of us were born. Now, if you'll learn that, you'll understand why there's so much trouble in the world. It's a result. I understand God created the whole human race. I get it. But technically, we are not in God's image. We're in Adam's image. The fallen age. That's why we get old. That's why we have pain. That's why we have suffering. That's how because of sin. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. They in a college or a university in the world can answer that question. You know why they think there's sick suffering in the world? Because evolution hadn't got us there enough yet to where we quit and, and overcome it. And that's why there's killing. And that's why there's murder. And that's why there's robbery. No, no. The Bible said sin is the curse. God is holy. People say if God's love, if God's love, why does he let all this fighting go on? And if God is love, why don't, why don't he do this and why don't he do that? And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you something God is before he's love. He's holy. His holiness is his main attribute. Love comes after that. And God will not accept something that's wrong. God will not.
condone something that's wrong. Well, you say, well, why don't he fix this mess? He's going to. We know how it's going to happen. We understand the times of the Gentiles must be fulfilled. Ladies and gentlemen, you can trust a book that answers life's hard questions. Know that. Let's talk here for a minute. Let's talk here for a minute. Number four, you can trust a book that predicts the future and gets it right 100% of the time. You can trust a book like that. You can trust a book that predicts events like the life of Jesus, his death on the cross, all of the good stuff, all the, that never misses it thousands of years before it ever takes place. You can trust a book like that. Now, let's talk about that just for a minute. Uh, once you abandon your authority, once we abandon our authority in this country, and we officially kick God and the Bible out in the 1960s, you, are, you, are, you lose your moral compass. You are aimlessly floating on the sea of life with no anchor, with no direction, just hoping that your decisions will turn out good and you don't get some sickness that makes you suffer in life. That, that, that's all the hope you've got. Uh, you, uh, you, you have no, no hope. We, me and you tonight, we have a book that predicts the future. Now let's talk for a minute about this, all this stuff going on in the world. Did you know that Israel and Jerusalem is, is showing us one of the things that we see about that the Bible's true? Did you know that Jerusalem is the, old, the only city in the world that survived the way it has? And, and, and all the other cities around, all them other cities about it have been renamed. All those uh, countries around Jerusalem are Muslim countries. And they're that one little spot. History begins and history ends. And it is the most controversial place on planet earth right now. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Why do you think every time you turn the news on, it's Israel, it's Israel, it's Jerusalem. The word Jerusalem means the city of peace. Salem. Salem means peace. You realize that, that in the city, no, no city in the world like Jerusalem. It has been destroyed, completely destroyed twice. It has been attacked over 50 times. And that is the most hated, most fought over piece of land on planet Earth. When you hear these little crybaby Idiots on college campuses go up and chant from the mountain to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the mountain, well, you know what they're saying? We want all of the land of Israel and all of the Jews. Now, listen, this side note, don't miss this. I am not supporting everything that Israel has done and is doing. I'm not supporting Benjamin Netanyahu. As a person and as as a political leader, I'm not. They they they, they make a lot of mistakes. They're wicked. They're they're enemies for God's sake, but or for our sake. But they're beloved for the Father's sake. What the Bible said. So those Jews over there, a lot of them made him Jews. And a lot of them are so mixed up, and they are after financial gain. And the Bible does call Jerusalem in the tribulation Sodom and Egypt. It's a wicked, filled, homosexual, filled, messed up city full of wickedness. I'm not saying that God, that Jerusalem is, is perfect and being a complete supporter of people who say they are Jews and are not. However, on the other hand, God did say Jerusalem was the apple of his eye. God did say he would restore them. God did say that he would fight against their enemies. God did say that real, true, honest to goodness, children of Jacob, the promises of God are not. The promises of God he made to Israel back there in the Old Testament are still true today. And one day they will be disturbed. I know there's people who are going to get very mad at me for saying this. I got preacher friends that say, Danny, I cannot believe you believe that. It's in the Bible, people. It's in the Bible. It says they are enemies for our sake, but beloved for the Father's sake. And Romans 11 said, God hath not forgotten His people which He foreknew. Now, I'll tell you why they hate Jews. When you hate Jews, it means you're anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism. They come from Shem. Uh, all most of us in here came from Japheth. Light skin, light colored hair, eyes, dark skin, ham, light, uh, brown skin, shim. Three, three nations, three of the ham, Noah's three boys. All of us come from one of them three boys or a mixture thereof. 
Now, we know in the Bible that a lot of those Jews over there are not real Jews. Understand that? And the man told me one time, he said, uh, you can't tell me that them 144,000, uh, that they, they ain't no 144,000 young, real birds and Jewish men. And I thought, well, maybe they ain't, but that still ain't no problem for God. You remember what he said one time? Ness fussed about that. He said, God's able to raise up these stones, children of Abraham. Front, he can raise them up in the tribulation to preach. And there's an example of that in Ezekiel where he said, Can these bones live? And Ezekiel prophesied, and they stood up, and flesh came on their bones, and they became a great army. Listen, just because you can't understand something, don't abandon your book. You can trust a book that says, God's still going to fight them battles. You know why? You know why Gentiles hate Jews? Because Jews can make money, and Gentiles worship money. They're jealous of them. Said one time, they used to say, take a Jew down the corner and set him out, come back next week, and he'd own a department store. You know, you've heard that. And that's true. God gave them the ability, a real one, to make money. Said one time in school, a, little, a teacher asked his kids a question, and they said, Who's the greatest man that's ever lived? And she had names up on the board. And she had uh, Muhammad and Abraham and Jesus and, and all greatly like that. And, and, and uh, Buddha and everything. Some little, some little kid, uh, Asian kid uh, said Buddha. And some little kid said uh, Jesus. And some, uh, uh, some other kid said Abraham. And, and had a little Jewish boy in there. And she said, who do you think, Johnny, is the most important thing? And he said, Jesus Christ. And so she pulled it down and said, you won the prize. And he's Jewish. And she, I mean, she said, I just, I just wondering, you're Jewish, right? And he said, that's right. My mom, we all go to the synagogue. So you don't even believe in Jesus, right? And he said, that's right. We don't even believe in him. She said, well, why did you say he was the greatest man? He said, really? He said, Abraham was the greatest man, but business is business. See, that's what they are. That's what they are. Uh, they can do stuff like that. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight, that's the truth. It is God has not forgotten him. Uh, according to the gospel, they are enemies for our sake, beloved, for the Father's sake. And these idiots on these college campuses, and look, I'm not taking a political stand right now. I could, but I'm telling you, you've got to be out of your mind. Look, it, it don't matter what color or what nation kids are from, they ought to be allowed to go to class without a bunch of weirdos throwing rocks and bottles at them and persecute them. It don't matter if they worship a devil. Turn that thing around and watch what would happen. The anti is you shouldn't do it against Hamas. We shouldn't kill innocent. They shouldn't kill innocent people in, in Palestine. Sometimes it happens in war, but innocent people should never be targeted. Innocent students going to class should never be targeted. There's a spirit that tells me the Bible's right. There is a spirit working against that, what God said in the Bible. And if you look, that's proof to me the Bible's Word of God. Jesus said in the last days, there's two big signs that He's coming back. One of the days of Lot, one of the days of Noah. One of the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, life as usual, big time, everybody living up and wasn't paying attention. That is definitely happening right now. The days of Lot, of, of, of the, well, the same-sex marriage. And Genesis 19, I'm not trying to be ugly. I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. But uh, uh, homosexuality, in according to the Bible, is an abomination. It's abomination. Now, one told me one time they said, well, 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 I can't help it. I can't help it if I'm attracted to my same sex. Well, what do you, so therefore it's all right. All right, what about people attracted to little kids? Is that all right? It will be in a few years. Mark my word, they're already saying it. Now, the truth is, it ain't all right. Neither is homosexuality all right. Neither is adultery all right. Neither is drunkenness all right. See, you got to understand that in the Bible, in Genesis 19, they were, listen, I seen an article the other day where a woman identified herself as ecosexual and was in a relationship with a tree. And this was her husband, this tree. Oh. This tree. Look, look, people. She needs to be in a mental hospital. 
There's people over in Asheville. I had a tree got cut down, and they was all around there crying and having a, free, a funeral for a tree. You know what that shows me? The Bible's right. They think we're crazy. They think we're crazy for believing there's a God Almighty that made everything and one day is going to fix everything and they believe it popped out of nowhere by itself and we are slowly evolving and getting better and better all the time. You can trust a book that predicts the future and never gets it wrong one time. Think about this. Years ago, the old preachers preached and they said, the Bible said in the book of Revelation, there's going to come a time when one man was going to run the whole world. He'll be called Antichrist. Opposite of Christ. Antifreeze. Make, not freeze. Opposite of Christ. Antichrist. And the Bible said he's going to run the world and he's going to cause everybody to have a mark on the right hand, in the right hand, or in the forehead. And it said nobody would be able to buy or sell without that mark on their, in their right hand or in their forehead. Do you realize in 1600, when that King James Bible was translated, nobody believed that could be possible? In 1700, nobody said, that, that's impossible. In 1800, that was impossible. In 1900, that was impossible. In 1950, that was impossible. But something began to change in 1950. I'm going to preach a message on here pretty soon. Go out on a limb a little bit. Fellow by the name of Jack Parson connected with Alistair Crowley over there, and uh, they they got in touch with some demons, and they thought they was aliens, but they're really demons. What what the news media sees as aliens are really demons, and they translate it as an angel of light, and they got and they conjured up stuff, and then the computers came out, and then Roswell happened, and in the fifties, and all the scientific advancements just suddenly all that knowledge came from somewhere else. That's what demon meant, higher knowledge. And uh, that knowledge came, and it got more, and it got more, and it got more, and it more, until tonight, nobody in here is shocked at all of the thought of paying for your groceries by scanning your hand. They couldn't say that a hundred years ago. They could That makes me know it's true. Why would that be in the Bible? How did that... You know what people think? They think that we watch the news and then we go hunt some kind of scripture that sounds like that and try. No! I, pre I got tapes of me preaching in the 80s, people, where I said exactly what I, I said. The day's going to come when you'll scan your hand at the store and to pay for your groceries. And I then I said, I have no idea how that's going to happen. I have no idea in the world how one man's going to know where everybody's at. You know, right now. There's 8 billion people in the world and there's 6.5 billion smartphones. 6 billion, that's almost enough for everybody if you leave off the babies. So, everybody in the world can be tracked now. It is very possible. And when a big emergency happened, you see that Wuhan flu was an experiment. We are lab rats. You know that, right? They're just experimenting on us to see how we're going to go. When a bigger one comes, I don't think it's going to be a, a sickness this time. I believe it's going to be some kind of cyber, something or another. I believe the internet is going to be shut down for a day or two or something. Uh, I, I, I think that. I really do. Might be after rapture. I don't know, but I think, brother, if that internet goes down, you talk about panic. You talk about people saying we'll do anything. Yeah, these people can't work, you can't buy nothing. You can't, I mean, they got you, buddy. They got us right where they want us right now. We're, 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 we're done. Uh, if that internet was to go down, it would stop everything. It would stop all commerce. Now, I'm still old-fashioned, and I use cash just as much as I possibly can. I do. I don't like credit cards. I don't like, I don't know how to do automatic bank. I don't fool that stuff. I'm going to resist as long as I can. Right, but I'm telling you something, brother. Uh, that day's going to come. There's going to be a big emergency, and all of a sudden, what we're people are going to see how that it is very, 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 very possible that one man can rule the world and that you can't buy or sell without a mark in your hand and in your forehead. See, when you go to the beach, you don't have to carry your pocketbook. All your money, you have to be all your information's right there. You don't have to worry about getting robbed. Stop drug deals out here. Sounds great to me. Stop a lot of the illegal flow of cash. Sound like a great idea. Hey, you know what that book said? 
2,000 years ago, John wrote. And he said, in the last days, there'll be two prophets. Moses and Elijah. It don't name them, but it's obviously Moses and Elijah. Shallow Bible students say, ain't it? But that can't be right. Ain't it? Look at what it said. Turn the waters to blood. Smite the earth with curses. Moses. Stop the rain three and a half years. Elijah. Uh, Jesus said, Elijah, come. that's the last two men mentioned in the Old Testament. Over and over and over and over and over and over. Enoch, you say, well, Enoch has to come back and die. No, he don't. Enoch is a picture of me and you walking around down here going up in the rapture and never will die. There had to be one man that never did die and never will die. That was Enoch. That was before the flood. Noah's not a picture of the second coming of rapture people. Noah's a picture of the Jewish remnant being preserved through the tribulation. Enoch was raptured out before the flood and before the tribulation. Get it right. Get it straight. And in the Bible, it said these two guys would lay in the streets of Jerusalem and the whole world would see their bodies laying there. When I started preaching that, I thought, I have newspapers? They're going to take newspapers to Zimbabwe and Uganda. And, show, and it said, it's see them. Nobody, I don't even think about that now. Everybody in the world watch what's going on in Jerusalem. Tonight, you know, it might be some far remote places where they don't have it yet, but the satellite and stuff there is available. They can. Do you see that? That can't be accidental. It can't be accidental. Listen, people, that when, when the Bible, they lay their dead for three days and everybody sees them? Are you kidding me? We don't, we don't believe the Bible because we're from the South and don't know no better and been taught that all our life. We don't believe the Bible because we're uneducated. We believe the Bible because... We heard old time real Bible preaching and God generated that seed in our hearts and we believed by faith and then studied it and read it and found out all of its precepts are right and found to be true. Amen, amen, and amen. I'm telling you, lastly, and I'm through. I don't usually preach this long, but y'all need it bad. Number five, I'm telling you tonight, Ladies and gentlemen, it, I, you can trust a book that tells you exactly what happens to you after you die. There's been thousands of books. There, there ain't nobody out there in the world knows what's going to happen. They say, oh, there ain't no heaven to help. They don't know that. They don't know that. They ain't never been dead. There's not a Bill Maher. There's not a comedian in Hollywood. Kathy Griffin. Uh, Howard Stern. Put them up here and say, you know for a fact there ain't no heaven and hell. No. They don't even know how to read the Bible. Why would you take somebody's advice that has no clue on the spiritual age? I can tell you somebody's been dead and got the keys of hell and death and came back and he told a story that there's two men. One was a rich man. One was Lazarus. And he said Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom was comforted. And the rich man died and in hell lift up his eyes. There ain't no other book in the world can tell you what happens to you after you die. Right? That's right. In Revelation 20 and verse 15, 11 to 15, and I saw a great white throne, and upon it him that sitteth, and, and uh, all at the dead, small and great, stood before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the book of life, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's what happens when a person dies. When a person dies without God, they wind up in hell and will stand in front of the great white throne one day and be cast in the lake of fire. The city of God's coming down out of heaven. The new Jerusalem. Me and you will live there forever with the Lord and shout for You can trust the book that tells you where we come from like that. D.L. Moody, before he died, was quoted. Voltaire, the atheist, was quoted. Voltaire said, I die abandoned by God and man. Thomas Paine, the famous infidel, said, I would give worlds if the age of reason had never been written. Charles Darwin, it is said, recanted many of his teachings on his deathbed. You know what D.L. Moody said? D.L. Moody said, this 
is my triumph. This is my coronation day and left this world. There's the difference of how people die who believe the book and those who do not. As somebody said, well said, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, and the way of salvation. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its history is true. Its decisions are mutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy. Let it be a light to guide you. Let it be food to support you and comfort you. Uh, let it guide you in life. It is a traveler's map. It is the pilgrim's staff. It is the pilot's compass. It is the soldier's sword. It is the Christian's uh, chart. It tells of paradise restored, heaven open, and hell disclosed. Christ is its subject. Your need is its design. God's glory is its end. Let it fill the mind, all the heart, guide the feet. Read it prayerfully. Read it frequently. Read it slowly. It is to be read in this life opened at the judgment and one day when the books were open this book will be open and we'll give an account of how we treated that book right there hallelujah you can trust the book that tells us where we're going when we die all right lucas kerrigan somebody come to the pen and get your bibles out and we're going to say amen blessed old book get your bibles up to this here tonight and this way we're going to end the service amen it is the god honored book of the entire world. Amen. Love it. Learn it. And live it. Holy Bible. Book divine. Precious treasure. Thou art mine. Mine to tell me whence I came. Mine to teach me what I am. Mine to chide me. When I robe. Mine. Thank you toes. You're the only one doing right. Amen. Everybody else. Mine to show a Savior's love. Mine thou art to give and guard. Mine to furnish or reward. Mine to comfort in distress. Suffering in this wilderness. Mine to show by living faith. Man can triumph over death. Mine to tell of joys to come. And the rebel sinner's doom. Holy Bible book divine. Precious treasure. Thou art mine. Let's get them ready. Go ahead. Look. All right. Help me now. Ready? It's a well of pure water. Red went. Come on, sing, girl. It's a battle. King. Hey, Amen. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When the world gets so dark you can't see. And not made one change in one word that said. But it sure made a change in me. Everybody ready? Get them up now. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand. It's true to him. It's solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Yeah. All right, let's get it up. Let's take it up a notch. When I think what it costs just to hold in my hand, I'm reminded, oh, a great debt to all of the martyrs. Sing it, ladies. There you go. Sing it out. Held it with their dying breath. Well, it's critics are many, and its believers are few. But there's one thing. Guess what? There's something wrong with you. All right, just get them up now, everybody. Say this blessed old book that I hold in my hand. It's true. It's all foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. One more time, everybody. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand. Woo! Through from beginning to end. It's solid. I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. All right. You may be seated. All right. All right. Now. Uh, all right, we're going to go now. Thank you for your patience tonight. I don't usually uh, preach that long. I felt like it's been on my heart for months to do that. 
And I got another one coming up. Y'all can turn the cameras off uh, pretty soon on some controversial stuff here in the next few weeks.